you would like to get a better night's sleep, experience ASMR as it's meant to be heard with headphones, and help support my channel all at the same time, click my affiliate link in the description box to purchase your own pair of sleep phones. Stay tuned to the end of this video for a very short demonstration of my sleep phone. Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Morocco. Morocco is located in Western Africa, kind of like the, the northern, westernmost point of Africa. You can see the Mediterranean Sea up here and the Atlantic Ocean over here. Now there's only three countries that border both the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean. Morocco obviously being one of them. If you know the other two, leave it in the comments. Morocco has some really interesting areas. We'll just kind of go top to bottom here. So usually I do borders first, but that's a little complicated. I'm going to do borders last this time. So starting up at the top here, geographically, not politically yet, we have the Rif Mountains up here. And then we have the very a big Atlas Mountains that dominate all of Northwestern Africa up to Algeria and Tunisia and all that. There are three ranges of the Atlas Mountains that run through Morocco. Up here we have the Middle Atlas. These are the High Atlas. And these are the Anti Atlas. In the little spaces between, particularly right here, the land's very lush and fertile. We've got that ocean wind, the mountains, rivers, all those kinds of things. So you can see lots of major cities over here. You can see the capital city of Rabat is right here on the water. Some famous cities you may have heard of is Casablanca, which is the title of one of my favorite movies and the setting of the movie. It's fantastic. Um, Marrakesh is located right here. We've got Fez up here, like the hats. Saleh is uh, a, like a very ancient city, older than most of these other cities I'm telling you about. And Tangier is located up here, right on the tip. Another important city in its history. As we move east past the mountains, we hit the Sahara Desert. And it's very Sahara-like. Let me show you the cover of the book we're going to flip through after. It's this. It's sand. It's a lot of very barren desert with oases here and there. And as we go further south and west, it just gets more barren and sandier. So let's go to political hist or political geography first. Up here in the north, there are two cities, if you can see here, belong to Spain. They are Ceuta and Melilla. And you can see there's Spain right here, just how close it is to Gibraltar and Spain. At least Ceuta is. There's Melilla. There's also lots of little islands in here that belong to Spain, but they're pretty tiny. It's a bit of a point of contention, these cities. From Morocco, but we'll discuss that in its history. Down south, it gets a lot more complicated. You can see this line right here, and down here you can see Western Sahara. So obviously we're going to talk about this extensively in its history, but most of this area is claimed by Morocco. It's a little let me show you something, actually. I've got my big map down here, right here on Western Sahara, so I can show you more details of the borders, because this book is from 10 years ago, where that was like the easiest demarcation. It's a little more complicated now. So here's a map of Western Sahara, and these little lines right here are all borders. You can see going all the way down here. So, 
anything on this side of the lines is occupied by Morocco. It's um, kind of debated internationally whether or not it should be that, but politically that's where we are at the moment. The other side over here, over here, is controlled by the like Western Saharan independence movement. And as you can see, there's not a lot here. There's some little like wadis, little watery areas that are only watery sometimes. Lots of little bitty rivers um, and very teeny bitty towns, basically oasis towns. Not much else is there, but this is the ancestral home of these people, the Sawadi people, and they claim it. They are obviously trying to claim all of this, but it's been a struggle for them and the Moroccans. So it's a, a little bit iffy, you know. Some people believe that Western Sahara is its own thing. Kind of a similar thing happening on that end of Africa, over in Somaliland, where, um, if you know the shape of Somalia, it's kind of shaped like the number seven. So the top part is Somaliland or Puntland, and people think that should have its own independence because there's a big independence movement and it's very different from the rest of Somalia. Kind of the same thing here, but just like a lot more violent, basically. You can see the map here considers this is part of Morocco, but like I said, pretty debatable. It, it really just depends on a lot of different things, I suppose. It's very convoluted, but that's Western Sahara. Is it part of Morocco? Is it not? Yes, no, maybe so. Just leave it at that. <laughs> All right, let's get this going. So we can do the borders real quick, because honestly, that's my favorite part of the geography section. I think it's really tingly. So technically, Morocco borders Spain up here. And we have this border with Algeria, which is important in its history. And if you consider this Morocco, it would border Mauritania. Um, but this whole border is part of the disputed territory of Western Sahara. So it technically does not border Mauritania, but it's complicated, right? <laughs> Political geography is very complicated. But as you can see, there's straight lines. And you know Mother Nature doesn't make straight lines. So you know that's a, a human agreement there as well. So let's figure out why all of this is the way it is. Let's get into the history of Morocco and then we'll flip through book and look at some wonderful pictures. So people have been living here for forever, basically. <laughs> There's very, very ancient human remains. People have been doing their thing for longer than we can comprehend, but the earliest people would have been the Berber people. There's many different like branches of Berber culture. The one in Morocco, at least in most of Morocco and Western Sahara, would be the Amazigh people. And they were pretty much like, these are Berber people here. Very um, nomadic. They've got their camels. They have their own distinct culture and festivals and language and alphabet, which is a really cool alphabet, by the way. And they've just been doing their own thing for a while. And have spent all of the rest of history struggling to continue to do their own thing. Oh, you can see a, a Berber person down here as well. Anyway, back in the ancient times, like prehistory, when people were living here, the territory was very different. It was more of a savanna and grassland, even with some watery parts to it. It was not this endless sand dunes as far as the eye can see. It was a lot more lush, a lot more hospitable. So that's one of the reasons why there's so many cool distinct cultures throughout the Sahara, particularly like the Northern Sahara, because they were there for so long, their land dried up and people just adapt. The Phoenicians came by. The Phoenicians were from that far end of the Mediterranean. And they were really good sailors, so they sailed all throughout the Mediterranean, and they established colonies along here, and that's exactly what they did in Morocco. They 
um, built lots of little towns and had their own colony set up here by the 6th century BCE. They had a colony in what's now Tunisia called Carthage and that took off. It was wildly successful and it became more powerful than the actual like Phoenicians over in like Tyre and all the, the Phoenician cities over there. So eventually Carthage came to control the, it was mostly just like up here. So they came to control that area. The Berber people here were none too pleased. You know, all they want to do is just live their lives. There were quite a few revolts, and this is the time when Berber Kingdom started to rise up. The most prominent was called Mauritania, which if you know your African geography, you know the country of Mauritania is down here. We're going to cover this country in about two weeks, so just hold on to that. We'll talk about that later, but Mauritania and the Carthaginian territories up here were eventually annexed by Rome in the year 33 BCE. Rome very famously fought against Carthage in the Punic Wars and wound up sacking the city of Carthage. I'm wobbling this way too much. I apologize. I'm gesturing a lot. And, um, yeah, it became Roman territory. There's some Roman sites that still exist around here. And they did not get along very well with the Berbers, as you can imagine. That's just the theme of this whole history segment is they did not get along with the Berbers. Just remember that. Eventually, the Roman Empire fell from influence in this area because of a barbarian group known as the Vandals, which is where we get the word vandals and vandalizing today, because that's what they did. They came through, and con including this part of Africa, and ransacked everything. So by the 530s, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, would have reclaimed this territory and held it under its control. Okay, I think I fixed the wobbling. No more wobbling. Okay, cool. Next people to come into the area were the uh, Arab Muslims from the Umayyad Caliphate. They came into the area in the 7th century. They brought the Arabic language and they brought Islam, which took off in the area. The Berber people actually converted to Islam in their own ways, you know, integrating Islam with their customs and traditions, making their own distinct version. And a lot of different dynasties would control this area. I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm just going to discuss the important ones. The first big one was the Idrisid dynasty. In the year 788, a man named Idris ibn Abdallah was living in what's now Iraq. I, I'm not sure if we know exactly all of the details, like what's true or not, but legend has it that his village was destroyed, he fled, he came all the way over here and established the Idrisid dynasty. And uh, many other um, Arabic dynasties would follow. We'll talk about some of them in this book. There were also some very powerful Berber dynasties that, at various points in history, would overpower the Arab ones. The two most important were the Almoravids and the Almohads. Now, if you've seen any other of my videos on West Africa, you might have heard of the Almoravids because they were quite the conquering people. They came through a lot of the West African empires and took them over. They also went up into Spain, into Andalusia, and started conquering up there in Spain, creating the, like, Moorish, Moorish area of Spain. The Amohads were the next successor. They were also very aggressive in terms of conquering and implementing Islam also. But you know, various dynasties would rise and fall at this time. Eventually, by the late 1600s, we have the Alawite dynasty, who is still ruling Morocco to this day. And they claim to be descended from the Prophet Muhammad, so that's really interesting. We have a long line of lineage from this royal family, stretching all the way back to Muhammad. It's really cool. So the next people to come to the area, well, the Portuguese came in for a minute in the 1500s, as the Portuguese did all throughout this, this whole side of Africa. 
and some of that side of Africa. It did not go well. The, they were not welcomed. Eventually the Spanish would come into the area, set up little trading areas. Uh, it did not go well. They fought a lot. There's quite a bit of warring going on. Spain would take some land, the Berbers would take them back, Spain would take them back. It was a big back and forth. Um, eventually Spain would come to control the coastline all up here. Tangier, interestingly, at a certain point in history just became an international city where it was just its own thing. And um, it was full of like different cultures and things all throughout Europe and Africa. Pretty cool. But everything else was Spain. Um, interestingly enough, in 1777, Morocco, or, you know, the, the ruling powers of Morocco, not Spain or anything like that, was the first to recognize the United States of America as a legitimate country, and they formed a friendship agreement that still holds up to this day, and has been very useful for Morocco. At the time, it was far more beneficial to the Americans so that they could safely trade in this area without dealing with the Barbary pirates which I discussed at length in my Algeria episode. You can learn a lot more about Barbary pirates there. Um, France declared a big war in 1860. Um, France kind of joined in. There was various wars. Oh, also I should say, um, the Ottoman Empire was over there, encroaching in this area, but Morocco fought back, and the Ottomans never managed to touch this area. So they were fighting with forces up there, forces over there. It was quite overwhelming. Eventually, um, you know, Spain would come to control the coast, like I said. They were also claiming parts down the coast over here. France was in control of Algeria at this time, so they wanted control of this area because it was connected to their area. They didn't want all this contention bordering their territory. So, a, a lot happened, a lot of war, a lot of riots, a lot of negotiations that went poorly, a lot of famous, like, crisis events for Morocco politically. But eventually, in the 1910s, the area was divided up into protectorates, with this chunk being the French protectorate and the coast here, and all down here being the Spanish protectorate. This was known as the Spanish Sahara at that time. Um, it was bad. The, the Berber people did not take this very well. There were some huge riots, some huge revolts, the biggest being the Rif War in the 1920s. Um, bad time. Lots of fighting back against the European powers. And then World War II would happen, and France would fall to Nazi Germany, so this area came under control of Vichy France, which was like the puppet state that was established in France. So the Allies came in in 1942 and liberated the area, and it became an important Allied base during the rest of the war. So, in 1943 was when independence movements started to happen in, like, you know, up here. And in 1953, France was getting really worried because the Sultan, um, Mohammed V, was pretty pro-independent, so they exiled him to Madagascar. Big mistake. If you thought people were mad before, they were even more mad now. So the, the rioting and all that was so bad that France brought him back a few years later. And um, France gave up its protectorate in 1956. Spain followed suit in most of the coastal area up here in that same year. And Morocco would gain its independence. Um, Mohammed V, who was like a very beloved figure in Morocco, actually passed away not long after independence was declared. So his son, Hassan II came to power in 1961. Um, my notes just says, not great. He was a pretty strict, very firm ruler. This area, or this area, this era is known as the years of lead in Morocco because he ruled with very strong iron fist, you know. And 
you know, there was a lot going on at that time. Um, he really cracked down on literally any aspect of anything just because there was so much political messiness going on. Um, you know, Spain had its exclaves up here. Morocco wanted them back. Um, they got Tangier at this point. Tangier is officially part of Morocco, but they didn't get Ceuta and Melilla. Um, and they wanted it, obviously. It's on their land. Spain said no. And um, down here, uh, Spain wanted to hold on to this. It became um, really, really messy. So I think by um, 19, I didn't write it down at the either the late 1960s, early 1970s, Spain finally pulled out and said, you know what? Morocco claims this land. Mauritania claims this land. You guys just figured out. Spain was going through a lot at this time anyway. It was a bit of a mess up on the Iberian Peninsula at this time. So, um, you know, war broke out down here. Also, war broke out with Algeria over the border and how it should be drawn up. Morocco would eventually lose. They wanted, it was called the Sand War because it was over these territories, which is nothing, it's just sand. Uh, but Algeria managed to claim the territories. So down here, we have conflict with Mauritania against Morocco and against the natives who lived here, who formed an independence movement called the Polisario Movement that was formed in 1973 to just try to fight back against everything and claim this land as their own independent nation. Hassan II had an idea, oh sorry, this is when Spain left, <laughs> my bad, um, called the Green March, which was a peaceful march in which the people of Morocco would enter the area armed with just flags and the Quran to show that they want to integrate peacefully and Spain would pull out. This is when Spain would pull out. Uh, but it was still a mess. It was, there's still a lot of fighting in between. Um, there, there is still today, it's not like a full on war, but there is still very tense conflict. Uh, lots of walls have been built to designate different areas because there are, there's a lot of phosphate in this area and there's oil reserves off the coast. So, of course, you know, Morocco wants it very badly. Ma uh, no, <laughs> Hassan II died in 1999. Muhammad VI became king. He's still king to this day. He's a lot more progressive than his father. And um, he's been trying to kind of modernize Morocco while keeping it as it always has been, you know, traditionally. During the Arab Spring protests in 2011, he declared a new constitution would be written, and indeed it was, uh, which gave more power to, like, parliament and the government, not so much in the hands of the king. Things like that. A little modernized. Um, over here, there's a cool picture of the Hassan II mosque that's in Casablanca. I just want to point this out because I think it's cool. They have the world's tallest minaret. It's the uh, tallest building, or the minaret is in Morocco, and I think in all of West Africa. It's the tallest building. I think that's cool. Lots of things named after Hassan II and Muhammad V. Important kings, you know. So Morocco is officially known as the Kingdom of Morocco, since there is a king. And basically that's where Morocco is today. Still very politically messy. Who knows what will happen with all of this and all of that. It's to be determined, I suppose. Let's flip through the book so I can show you some cool pictures of Morocco. Let's see, let's see. Oh, cool. You know what? Let me zoom this out a smidgy. There we go. That's a neat picture. Look at all the blue. Oh, gorgeous. This is kind of like, when I think of Morocco, I picture this kind of like art style, you know, <laughs> architecture and lights and stuff. This is Marrakesh. This is, well, mosaics, a very you know, prominent architectural style all throughout Morocco. This is actually a drinking fountain, isn't that something? That's just like a regular drinking fountain and it's absolutely gorgeous. There's a political map of Morocco. And here we can see some spices for sale. Look at these. Cool. That's in Marrakesh as well. This is from the Arab Spring protests. 
which, you know, and, and during the Arab Spring, some of the protests went very well. Some of them did not. So technically, Morocco went very well. It never got violent or led to any horribleness. So it was one of those Arab Springs that actually led to some progress. And there's some sweet faces there. <laughs> wow, gorgeous desert and camels and oh, beautiful. Well, let's see. So here is um, Milia down here. And one of the issues with having these cities is that, you know, they're part of Spain. If you are in these cities, you are in Spain. So you can cross to mainland Spain without a passport. So a lot of Africans are sneaking in illegally and then hopping on ferries to go to Spain to get to Europe to find work and better lives, which is illegal. So they have been trying to stop this from happening. Um, but, you know, if people need safety and security, they'll find a way to get it. So it's only endangering everybody. But that's one of the arguments in allowing these cities to be part of Morocco. I think the other side is that they've been part of Spain for like some 400 years or so. So it would be kind of sudden, you know. Anyway, gorgeous river. This is in the Rift Mountains. more beautiful and yes there is snow in morocco they actually have a ski resort up in the um um the up in here near america and gorgeous farmland as well and beautiful atlas mountains and beautiful sand dunes as well in the desert how gorgeous a little oasis over here lots of date palms and we've got some famous cities here you can see let's see this is it'll usually say in here somewhere what these cities are I don't want to guess you know this is in Marrakesh big beautiful minaret there for a mosque and let's see oh this is Casablanca it's all white obviously Casablanca Um, lots of snow, I should say. Not some snow, lots of snow. Some very ancient walls here as well. And this area is very seismically active. There have been some very devastating earthquakes, particularly in the north. Here's a gorgeous little fennec fox. There's such beautiful animals. Camels, of course, being not just like important to the country, but the whole of the Sahara, Maghreb region, all of that. This is the Barbary lion. At least, I assume that's a picture of a Barbary lion. Um, they're considered extinct in the wild, and it's kind of debatable if some are still in zoos, if they are actually Barbary lions. They were hunted pretty extensively. They were, um, like, the biggest lions out of, like, all the lions in Africa you think of little Barbary macaque. Whether they're in Africa or Japan, they love the snow. <laughs> Some flamingos flying by. Look at these ibises. <laughs> Those are intense. <laughs> and look, I would normally say like snake warning, snake warning, but this is not a snake. This is a bird. This is the Egyptian nightjar. And let's look a little closer so you can actually see the little birdie. Can you see it? All nestled up. Very good camouflage. Some acacia trees here. This very beautiful landscape. And some gorgeous gardens. This is in Marrakesh. And this is in Tangier. Kind of looks like San Francisco. To be honest. But it's Morocco. Look at this trilobite fossil. Because like I said, this used to be a very watery part of the world. So there's some interesting watery fossils that are found there. Some Phoenicians meeting some African people here, trading. Really gorgeous Roman mosaic. This is probably like the most famous Roman town left in Morocco. This is Volubilis, which is in ruins now, but very important 
some traders here. Look at their spears. Wow. They mean the business. All right, some dynasties here. So yellow is the Idrisid, which they founded the city of Fez. And it would be the Almoravids, who founded the city of Marrakesh. Then the Almohads would be in blue. You can really see how far they went into Spain, right? And Portugal. And I didn't mention the Marinid dynasty, but they controlled all up here. Let's see. A Portuguese tapestry showing Portuguese troops entering Tangier, wearing all their armor, you can see. And look at this. So I didn't really talk about um, Ismail bin Sharif, who was from the, pretty sure, the Alawite white dynasty. Um, he pretty much built up the city of Meknes. Uh, he was a pretty cruel ruler, but he loved architecture. Beautiful, beautiful buildings. So this is from his tomb. This is um, what was the first little consulate for the United States. It's now a museum. Colonial Morocco, 1923. So you can see Spain, the Canary Islands too. And up here, the Tangier International Zone. And the French was all in green. And yeah, pretty <laughs> divided up there. Here's a cool picture of Tangier from the 1920s, I assume. Here's a photo from the Rift War. And let's see, some Moroccans marching through Italy, World War II, to fight. <laughs> He's excited to fight. <laughs> yep, helping out the Allies. And here's a really cool photograph of a meeting in Casablanca. We've got... Um, Mohammed V, Franklin Roosevelt, and Winston Churchill having a very important war meeting. Here's an independence rally and an independence parade, 1956. Here's a photo of Mohammed V. And this is really cool. This is a festival that honors, let me see his name, Mohammed. Sheikh Mohammed Lakdaf, who was a Sarari leader, basically the, the culture that's fighting for independence in Western Sahara. So um, when he died, he has his own like sacred burial space. And every year, all the different Berber cultures come together and have a big festival to honor him. We've got, oh, this is a photo of the Green Mark. So you can see they came flags, Qurans. Here's Hassan II. And let's see. Western Sahara, that was the Green March there. And let's see, Moroccan walls. Oh, it's a map of all the walls that were built, which I showed you on the other map. It just shows when they were built. And I think on the next page has a picture of one of the walls. Yep. Look at that. So this surrounds a phosphate mine, the walls dividing it. And like I said, there is nothing in these spaces, right? It is desert, desert. Here's Muhammad VI. And let's see, a women's rights protest. And Casablanca, it says. Let's see another photo of Muhammad VI. And the flag, let's read about the flag. It says, the flag of Morocco consists of a field of bright red with a green five-pointed star in the middle. The flag was adopted as the symbol of Morocco in 1915 before it became an independent nation. The green five-pointed star is associated with Islam. Green is also said to represent the green of the palm tree, a vital tree to the desert. Red represents royalty and symbolizes bravery and strength. Here's a photo of Muhammad VI as a boy doing, you know, political things even when he was young, being taught well. Here he is again. Here's the House of Representatives. And this is a courtroom, it says. And look, here's going to be the next king of Morocco. 
also doing lots of you know political everything to prepare and this is in Fez look at the buildings are just so beautiful in Morocco and here is Rabat you can see the old walls here and here's a map of it you can see this is the old part here called the Caspa and lots of different quarters there gardens of course The only female cabinet member of Morocco, Basima Hakawi. And lots of flags being waved there. Oh, he's got some nuts for sale. Looks like pistachios, I'm not sure. Oh, wow, isn't that incredible? Fabric shop. Oh my gosh, I bet you could find so many beautiful things there. Here's a food stall, which you can almost smell this picture. Just smell the spices coming off of it. And look at this. This is this open tannery in Marrakesh. It says here it stinks terribly, but I bet this is how they've tanned leather for hundreds of years, right? And here's a potter making some beautiful pottery, I'm sure. And there are lots of beautiful scenic beaches in Morocco as well. It's like a one of those vacation hot spots for Europeans and Africans. The blue town of Chefchouan, I want to say it is. And they've got some dates here. Another very important food here. You can see them growing on the tree. And let's see. Oh, he's got some fish. He's a fisherman. Some of the money that they use in Morocco. They use the Duran. And here's a phosphate factory. Phosphates are used in fertilizers. Here's a big resources map. You can see pretty much just phosphates. <laughs> and here's a wind farm. And we've got uh, shipping containers coming into Tangier. It says. Enjoying the nice day there. And about population map so you can really see everyone pretty much just lives here because there's not much else anywhere else in Morocco. This is a great photo. You can see these Amazigh people and the women like previously used to tattoo their faces not so much anymore so you only really see it on the elderly women and it's still beautiful. I think it's incredible. Oh, cool. <laughs> a little happy meal there. And practicing their French. Les enfants jouer. Oh, it's verb conjugation time. There's a lot of Conjugating verbs in any language is such a nightmare. <laughs> Some beautiful Arabic script. Look at that. All the little, like, leaves and flowers woven into it. That's lovely. And this is the Amazigh alphabet with the Phonetic one next to it. It's absolutely stunning. Alphabet there. That's so cool. It looks like like a space alien alphabet made up for like a sci-fi movie. You know? It looks so cool. Working hard in school. Working very hard. This this one right here is working very hard. This is considered the oldest university in the world. It is the Karavian University. And it's still a school to this day. It's established in 859 in Fez. And some college students here. And let's see. Oh, this is an adult class to teach women to read and write. And doing some project. Don't you hate group projects? It's the worst. Let's see. I'm doing a ritual bath. Or wash, I suppose, before praying. And, oh, this is a synagogue. So, Jewish people have had a long tradition in Morocco. Um, like, for a long time. Uh, most notably, when the, the Moors were kicked out of Spain, they were kicking out not just all the Muslims, but anyone who wasn't Catholic. So, a lot of Jews came into Morocco at this time. Um, also, very famously... 
uh, Mohammed V, once the, the area came under control of the Nazis, he refused to give up any of the Jewish population and protected them, but um, still faced a lot, the Jewish people, and a lot of them immigrated to Israel once that became a thing. In prayer. Calling to prayer here. Look at that cool photo from the 1930s. That's awesome. And cooking up lots of food for Ramadan. You gotta cook up tons of food for when the sun goes down. And here's the Hassan the second mosque that we saw in my atlas there. Hope we've got some sheeps ready for slaughter for Eid al Adha, which is a tradition. The, the family slaughters it. Anything that's left over gets donated to the poor and hungry. And having some prayer there. And reading some of the Quran. This is obviously the chapter that explains religion with Islam being the state religion. It's a lot of like basic Islam photos, I suppose. This is a madrasa. A madrasa is like a, a like a a school for Islamic studies, mainly for like kids or younger people. It's I feel like throughout the world, the the Islamic world, um, madrasa rules are kind of different, but that's the gist of it. And there's a wonderful face there. More gorgeous cloth, isn't that beautiful? Let's see. This is cool. I was just reading this this little town. Let's see. They um, offered some local artists to paint some of the blank walls and now it's become like an art festival to paint the town. Let's see. We've got a political author here, Driss Tribe. A street musician looking very jolly. And of course playing some football. I I really want to make a collection of all the photos in these books of kids playing soccer and football in like various parts of the world because it's like if there's a flat surface there's kids playing football, right? This athlete here, Noval El Mutawakel, she was the first Moroccan woman to win an Olympic medal. She was the first African woman and the first Muslim woman to get a gold medal at the Olympics and she became a prominent member of the Olympic Committee. This is a marathon in Morocco, the Marathon des Sables, which is um, 240 kilometers through the desert. That sounds horrible. And let's see, I like that outfit. Look at the signs and clothes. Oh wow, the bride, her wedding ceremony, very lavish. And this festival, which I still don't quite understand, they race their horses up to the crowd firing their guns, but then they like stop right in front of the crowd. That sounds horrible. <laughs> I would be crying. <laughs> that sounds intense. A wonderful music festival here. And for some Berber tribes, they're so isolated that they have fiancé fairs where they get together and work out marriage agreements. Henna beautiful like tattoo style mainly for weddings and look at this Riyadh like the little Moroccan courtyard this is a tagine pretty sure that's how you say it very traditional way of cooking and serving food and here's a lot more date nuts coming off the trees there and mint tea is the national drink it's everywhere apparently and that's the end of the book so thank you so much for watching i do hope that you found this video relaxing and educational i'll have another video about morocco for you tomorrow a whispered one so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out thank you again and have a very good 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 night So this is my actual pair of sleep phones that I've had for many, many years. You can tell it's mine because it's absolutely covered in cat hair. <laughs> my cat sleeps on my pillow with me, so he gets right next to my sleep phones. Sleep phones are washable, though.
you just take the little headphone things out and wash it in your washer. But anyway, I was using it last night, so there's still cat hair on it that I can't get off. But sleep phones are headphones in this headband that you wrap around your head. The speakers are right in there. I know you can't see it. They're inside. And you can listen to all of the best ASMR while laying down without worrying about earbuds or big bulky headphones or anything like that. This thing is life-changing. This is actually my second pair of sleep phones. My first pair I took to a friend's house and accidentally left it there and then she said, oh, no problem, I'll send it back to you. And she actually tried it out that night and instead just bought me a new pair. This pair, because she loved it so much, she kept my old pair. It's fantastic. It is um, really, like, the best way to experience ASMR if you use ASMR to fall asleep. I know I was listening the other day to the new video by Ella ASMR, who does sci-fi role plays and she is the master of binaural let me tell you you can watch her videos without headphones but if you wear them with headphones it's a whole different experience and you know i wanted to nod off to her video but i wanted to hear all of the amazing little sounds you can't hear without headphones so sleep phones came through for me and i loved the video it was fantastic and i slept really well so, you can purchase your own pair of sleep phones down in my affiliate link. Oh my gosh, look at all this cat hair. <laughs> and it comes in so many different colors. It comes in different types. There is one that is wireless that you hook up with Bluetooth. There is um, run phones and telephones and even a specific ASMR sleep phones that comes preloaded with ASMR in it. So there's something for everyone, honestly. It is a fantastic product. Um, I've been using mine for years and years now, and I can't recommend it enough. So check out the link if you're interested.